I think it's much more about inspiration, not about leadership. What's wrong and what are we yearning for in our leadership? We're yearning for people who inspire us. Think about it. The people that you think of as great leaders were people who inspired you. There are leaders who are very effective leaders, but they're not inspiring. But everybody who inspired you is a leader. And that's, I think, what we are wanting to talk about now. Now, it's not just about inspiration as an interchangeable word with motivation, either. There's a big difference between the two. And I want to explain the difference to you. Motivation, and we usually use these interchangeably, motivation and inspiration, they're almost exactly the opposite. Motivation means to provide a motive, to incite, to induce, to impel. It's coercive. Motivation is the fundamental theory on which we built our leadership thinking. As a matter of fact, it's the theory on which we built just about everything. Think about the worlds we live in. Think about politics. Vote for me or the bad guys will get you. This is a motivational statement. Think about marketing. Buy my product or you'll be ugly. Think about religion. Join my religion or you'll go to hell. Think about education. Pass the exam or I'll fail you. Think about healthcare. Follow this protocol or you'll get sick. We're endlessly working with motivational patterns which we built into our leadership theories and which now are pervasive across all of our society. It's what we know, it's what we rely on, and what we've come to think of as the standard. Motivation is really about changing other people's behavior, usually for my benefit, not for the other person's benefit, for my benefit. I will give you a bonus if you achieve your budget or your target, because if you do, then I get what I need. I will pro provide you with a $2 off coupon to motivate you to buy my product, because if you do, then we'll make millions of dollars in our company. So motivation then is about steering the behavior of other people, and it's about fear. Now inspiration, on the other hand, from the Latin sperare, meaning spirit, to affect, guide, or arouse by divine influence, to fill with enlivening or exalting emotion, to animate a divine influence upon human beings, to give life the breath of God. That's not the same thing. That's a whole different idea, a whole different order of thinking than motivation. Inspiration is an act of love for another person. It's an act of service, it's a gift. It's something we give to others without a need for anything of our own. I'm not saying that motivation is wrong. I'm saying it's different, and there are times when we need to motivate. For instance, if this room catches fire, I'm going to motivate you to get out of here. But we don't know enough about this subject to even know the difference. And we, as leaders, need to know when should we motivate and when should we inspire. We're very good at motivating. We've got this down. We're not so clear about inspiration. And we need now to become as good at inspiring others as we have become at leading them. Does that make sense? Motivation, then, is about the need for each other. And inspiration is about the love for each other. Motivation is lighting a fire under someone. And inspiration is lighting a fire within someone. See the difference? So, I'll give you another example. This is a little mouse, laboratory mouse. Normally, this little mouse, in its normal way of life, would live for two years. Let's suppose we put this little mouse into a cage about this high, above the ground, in a university lab and we'll introduce a cat into the room every 30 minutes. So the mouse freaks out every time this happens and eventually dies in six weeks, completely stressed out and burned out. We'll put a another mouse, put the same mouse in the cage. Actually, we can't put the same mouse in because this one's dead now, but you know, we'll put a similar mouse into the cage and we look after it, we nurture it, we cosset it, we tell it we love it, we play with it, we're careful with it. And that mouse will live for six years. Now here's a very interesting thing. We take these two mice, 
the stressed out, burned out one and the nurtured and cared for one. And we open them up on the lab table. And inside we see that their organs have aged identically. This is what we do to each other. This is what happens when we think that we are being inspiring when in reality we're more likely to be motivating. So here's how the system works. I'm going to take you through this little science uh, journey here. You've probably heard of good stress and bad stress, right? Well, there's another idea I want to ask you to dump. There's no such thing as good stress. It's all bad. We mean something else, which I'll explain in a moment. But there's stress, and that will, in the end, kill you. Stress comes from fear, which is the same thing as motivation, because it comes from fear as well. And stress, if you look at it, and the fear, if you look at that too, as the sort of combination here. On the left, what you'll see in this diagram is the biochemical effect of fear. When I use language like I'd kill for something or I want to die for something, we activate the emotional centers of the brain. They in turn release stress hormones into the body. That shuts down our immune system. This leaves us vulnerable to disease and burnout and that creates stress. We're literally and physically feeling ill. Let me show you the emotional side, which is on the other side of this little diagram. When we're frightened, we're, doing, we're always doing one of two things. We're either growing or decaying. When we're frightened, we can't grow because what we're trying to do is survive. And all of our fear and flight uh, mechanisms come into play, so we start to decay. When we decay, our skills, when they decay, they lead to impotence. And impotence, in turn, leads to low self-esteem. When we lose our skills, we feel poor about ourselves or poorly about ourselves. And low self-esteem leads to loss of control and that leads to stress. See how that works? So the language we're using and the way we're using it and the metaphors and the stories we tell each other are actually creating toxic chemistries in our body. It's no accident that, for instance, people who love what they do are inspired and never sick. It's no accident either that when we're with someone who speaks the language of aggression and war all the time with us, and though we may like them a great deal and respect them, we can't explain why when we leave that we're not inspired. And the answer is because it's subconscious. It's something we don't know about and most of us don't know the science about. Let me show you the opposite now. When we say good stress, what we actually mean is exhilaration. When we love something or love doing something or love someone, we're exhilarated. And when we're exhilarated, here's what happens. On the left side, same part of the diagram, same part of the brain is activated, excepting here, we activate different chemistries altogether, different biochemicals in the body. And this activates the immune system, it doesn't suppress it. This leads to the high that we talk about, the runner's high, the healer's high, and so on. And this inspires us, this is exhilarating. On the emotional side, when you love something, the first thing you do is you learn more about it. If you love playing the violin, you take violin lessons. And learning leads to mastery. We'll talk more about that later. Mastery, greater the mastery, the greater the self-esteem. The higher the self-esteem, the more control we have. Control leads to inspiration and exhilaration. See how that works? So I want to ask you to think about the language you use, because if you want to be inspiring, use language that fires the chemistry in the body that inspires. So this is Mike McAllister, the CEO of Humana. And we asked him three basic questions that Joe alluded to. Questions that can change everybody's life. And I want to give you these questions now. The first one is why are you here? I want to know why you're here. I don't need you to tell me this now, but I want you to think about why are you here? What is the point of your life? The second question, how do you want to be while you're here? How would you like people to know you? What's your reputation going to be? How will you think people will describe you after you move on from here? And lastly, your calling. What are you called here to do? What are your gifts and talents and skills and how are you going to use them to serve the world and change it? Those are three very big questions. 
There are three questions that many leaders never ask all their lives. But I want to suggest to you this. When a leader goes through this process and thinks carefully through why they're here, how they're going to be, and what they're going to do with their lives, their destiny, character, and calling, if you're standing in the presence of a person who's done that, you're standing in the presence of an inspiring person. They can't help it because they're so inspired. It radiates from within them, and you feel it. Because you know this is a person that's on this planet for a particular reason, and it's a high order idea. Secondly, we want to build inspiring relationships. This is all part of creating the, the environment where we are inspiring and where we, where we are inspired. We can't be inspiring if we don't have relationships with other people that are inspiring. So here's an idea for how to, to build that. I met a wonderful man called Mike Sturm some years ago, and he was a, an educator. And what he learned was a very interesting thing. He, he was wondering, why do kids in schoolrooms have the same teacher with the same message, and yet they will have different and varying degrees of learning going on? And this happens all the time. And he discovered that people have different learning styles, and he identified what they were. And I'll share those with you. The learning styles he identified were four. The first one is called explore. And what that is is really about ideas, creativity, imagination, possibility, brainstorming. In other words, what it, what it really is for those kinds of people who like that energy, prefer that energy, they love ideas, they love to exchange thinking, they like to have fresh thinking, and they're always exploring and changing their perspectives on things. The second group of people is around the excite energy. And that's about people. These kinds of folks learn through exchanging with each other, through communication, dialogue, social interaction. The third energy is examine energy. These are people who love data. They study the metrics. They analyze their rational thinkers. And their energy tends to go in the direction of trying to find a hole in something, not to destroy it, but to see if it's really true. And once they've discovered that, then they really buy into the idea. That's how they learn. And lastly, execute. These are people who get things done. They don't like user manuals. They don't stop to spend time thinking and talking about it. They just move. And these are people who like action. They like to finish it and move on to the next thing. This is how they learn. So we have these four learning styles. We all have all parts of this in us, but in different quantities. And if you can learn how to connect with other people by relating to those different learning energies, you will inspire them and build inspiring relationships. What it also does is it stops us dismissing people who aren't the same as we are, and therefore changes the dynamic of the relationships. How many of you have a mission statement? Can I see a raise of hands? So most of you have a mission statement. I'm gonna suggest that if I took all your mission statements collected them all up, put them in a big heap on the floor, shuffled them all up, and gave them back to you at random, I don't think you'd know whether you got your own back or not. Because <laughs> I think they basically will say very much the same thing. And I would say that typically the whole process that we've all learned now over a long time over the years of building mission statements is no longer inspiring. People just don't remember them. They think they're too long and wordy, and we're playing to the gallery for all kinds of interests. We have too many people on committees putting, sticking their oar in and having an opinion and so on, and eventually we get mush, which we call a mission statement. I don't think that uh, any of these people had a mission statement. I think they had something very different. I think they had a dream. They had a dream that was powerful and inspiring and lifted up the spirits of the people that they worked with. But it particularly lifted their own spirits. Um, I know a lot of athletes, and I can tell you that nobody gets to the Olympics with a mission statement. They get there with a dream. That's what gets them to the Olympics. If you don't have a dream, you're not gonna get there. If we want to be even half as good as that, why wouldn't we do the same thing? So I want to ask you to think about the mission statement you've got. Visit that idea and maybe change it and scale it up to the idea of having a dream. We're not able to predict, for example, new products and whether they'll succeed. 70% of new products fail every year. 
We can't predict elections. We can't even get the weather right. We're in all kinds of trouble when it comes to research methodology. So we're looking for a system that is better than this, and indeed one that flies below the conscious mind so we can't manipulate the data, so we don't get things skewed as a result. We found such a system. And what we're looking for is something we call permission space. We're looking for the idea of the constituents that you have in your community, all the people that will help you to be successful in your chambers and what permission they will give you for a particular direction, strategy, vision, or what I call a dream. You can't, in other words, make a strategy work unless you have permission from all the people who are going to help you. And you can't really ask them in the way that old-fashioned methodologies of research will get that done for you. You have to go in a way that's under the conscious mind, below the radar, in other words. What's deep in their hearts where if you had something that was magical, they would support you? ATB Financial is a bank in Alberta, owned by the government. Now, I just want to say that slowly. This is a bank owned by the government. This doesn't get much worse than that. Okay? But this is a very extraordinary company, and they want to break out of that kind of mold. So they want to create a dream, and the things that they learn about permission space, you know, what do people want for them? They want a bank that can change the world. I'm going to keep saying this, they're a bank. You know, banks don't typically change the world, not in a good way, anyway. People want them to put people first, and they want a bank that helps people achieve their dreams. So ATB's dream became just that, changing our world by putting people first and making their dreams come true. Now, I want to show you how this impacts what happens next. It's not just fluff. This is not just a statement that's happy in the advertising and so on and gives all the copywriters and marketers fun. This is not what this is about. This is about changing behavior, attitude, the way we live, everything we do, and building something that's extraordinary and inspiring. So in the 17th Street branch in Edmonton, Alberta, walks a young man, 17 years old, and he asks the manager if he can borrow some money to buy a car. And the manager says, do you have a bank account? And he says, no. He says, do you have a checking account? No. Do you have a credit card? No. Do you have a job? Well, I've just got a job. I've had a job for a week. It's a new job. So the bank manager says, you know, a 17-year-old young man walking into a branch of a bank and asking for money to borrow for a purchase of a car who doesn't have a bank account, no credit card, and has had his job for a week, every manager would say no. But we have a dream at this bank. And if I said no, I wouldn't be living the dream. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to open a bank account for you. I'm going to give you a credit card. I'm going to ask you to pay your credit card every month promptly. Come back and see me in six months. And if you do that, I'll give you the money. That's how we make dreams come true. That's how we change people's lives. That's how you operationalize what we're trying to talk about here. So I asked a group of people what they do not like about leaders. Not what they like about leaders. We've heard a lot of that. What they don't like. What's going wrong for them? Very interesting. Here's what they said. They said they don't like cowards. They don't like phony people. They don't like self-serving, selfish people. They don't like liars. They don't like fear-based leaders. And they don't like idiots. And it's interesting, isn't it, that that actually summarizes about 80% of leaders. And you know them, you've worked for them, you've seen them in your careers, I'm sure. This is disappointing. However, I'm a simple thinker. If this isn't working, why don't we just do the opposite? Stand this whole thing upside down. And here's what that looks like. Inspirational leaders, leaders who are inspiring, are courageous. They're authentic. They serve others. They tell the truth, they're loving, and they're effective. 
If we live that way, these are called the Castle Principles, because that's the acronym, we will be inspiring leaders. So let me take you through the Castle Principles one at a time, because this has become the way of living for a lot of people in lots of parts of the world. Courage, it all starts here, courage. You know, you're not gonna change unless you have the courage. You're not gonna leave here and do something bold and dramatic and better unless you have the courage. You're not gonna learn anything unless you have the courage because you won't be able to say, what I know is not right anymore or that my values and beliefs and ideas are out of date and not contemporary with current thinking. It'll take you courage to say, I need help. I was wrong. I need you to support me. I can't do this on my own. It'll take courage for you to say to someone, I love you, or I'm sorry, or will you forgive me? All these things take courage. We can't do anything until we're courageous enough to do it. So it starts with courage. Can we make breakthroughs quickly? Yes, we can, and it's a myth that we can't. Authenticity. Followers love authentic leaders. What's wrong with our leadership right now? It's phony, that's what's wrong with it. We just don't know where we stand with so many people in leadership positions. And we want to know where we stand. We're passionate about that. And we love leaders who are like that. So, what does that look like, authenticity? Well, authenticity looks like this, really. It's when the mind, the mouth, the heart, and the feet all say the same thing. So how many people do you know who say one thing and do something else? Who feel one thing and say something else? Or who feel one thing and then do something else? I mean, you can't get all four of these pieces together. So true authenticity is when everything comes together like that. And what we think, what we say, what we feel, and what we do are the same thing. 